This is BioBusters, Professors Hanging Out Talking Science, episode number 36, recorded on March 3rd, 2021. Hello, folks. Welcome back. You are listening to the podcast that takes you out of the classroom and into the trenches of science. Uh, I'm Dr. Abi Abdallah. I'm here with doctors, Dr. Fawner and Dr. Keller. Uh, Hello. If you're watching us online, you can uh, see their names on their screen. You can tell who's who. Uh, Starting with this episode, we're going to have video as well, in addition to audio. So for those of you that listen to us like you normally do, uh, just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, for those of us that, uh, for those of you that like to see video, you can uh, find us uh, online now. We're hoping to get on uh, YouTube and uh, maybe Daily Motion, or actually, who, who Daily wouldn't Motion want to see three? YouTube. Who wouldn't want to see three handsome, gentlemanly scholars? Easy there, <laughs> talking about COVID science weird medical disorders, things of that nature. You're going to have to like this podcast a lot now, Father. <laughs> Every account you have. That's right. That's right. So uh, how are we all doing? The uh, weather is starting to change a bit in Erie, which is a nice thing. Yeah, yeah it'll, be, it'll be back and forth for a little bit, but it's warming up. Well, wasn't it last year? Um, it, I remember we were getting ready to move and we looked it was like a Saturday or a Sunday and it must have been middle of May or first, second week of May. And it was snowing outside. Mm. It was snowing, you know, it was kind of weird. Yeah, I, 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 don't, mean, I don't, I guess I don't expect here. it to uh, stay nice weather for too long. You know, we're at least due for a few more uh, snowstorms here. I just really am hoping that um, no more snow on the ground for days or weeks on end because the puppy loves to gulp down the snow when he goes outside so standing out there for 20 minutes in five degree weather as he gulps snow and I finally say, okay, get the hell back inside. And then 10 minutes later, as I try to fall asleep, I hear the sound of water running, but it's not water. It's urine. <laughs> yeah. That's uh it's been a struggle, but well, we're in the uh, clear. Does he, does the puppy just eat any, 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 is he selective in the snow he eats? You know where I'm headed no, with this no, one? Uh, Cause you've got it, another, it, it, you've got another dog that goes outside. <laughs> But if it's, come on. he will, he will sniff around. He won't eat the yellow snow as we were all taught, you know, growing up. Right. Um, right. It's again, I mean, he was cute when he was a puppy. Now I just need him to grow up, get some bowel control and leave me alone at night. Well, what you've got another couple months, right? All right. Fingers. fingers crossed. So uh, whose birthday do we have today? March 3rd. 1847, Alexander Graham Bell. Big one. Big one, yeah. Yeah, that is a big Mm -hmm. one. So a Scottish-American inventor of the telephone. Uh, His career was uh, slightly influenced by his uh, grandfather, who apparently uh, published on speech impediments and, uh, you know, uh, people with uh, deafness. And uh, his father uh, was interested in methods of vocal communication. Apparently, his mother was deaf as well. So as a teenager, he uh, sort of was interested in hearing sounds, things like that. And uh, he moved to Canada when he was 23. And um, he began giving instruction in uh, something called, eventually uh, it moved to the U.S., something called Visible Speech at the Boston School for Deaf Mutes. That's what it was called at the time. And uh, he uh, was interested in trying to see ways of transmitting uh, voices over wires. And he eventually invented the telephone and was awarded the uh, first U.S. Patent, uh, patent for the telephone on March 7th of 1876. Uh, he co-founded the Bell Telephone Company in 1877. And, uh, you know, I, I found this uh, uh, online and I thought it was interesting. Apparently, he reestablished the journal Science, the famous journal Science, in 1882. It had gone out of publication. And then with his father-in-law, I guess they, they put that back together. And uh, a lot of people, well, some people know this, but a lot of people don't know it. 
Uh, he co-founded uh, AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph Company, mm-hmm. in 1885. I think they've come a long way since then. <laughs> they, they, yeah. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, uh, what, do you, what do you think Alexander Graham Bell would say about cell phones? Uh, I, I don't know. He if, if he had not followed up, I think the evolution of the technology, he would probably be weirded out by them. Right. But do you think he had the foresight to imagine that if potentially, you know, this is something of that nature or something that advanced could come down the line with advancements in technology? It was probably so far ahead. I don't know. Yeah, what, my guess probably, years? yeah, my guess probably not. I feel yeah. like our imaginations, you know, we tend to say, oh, the sky's the limit, but but they're really bounded by what, by what we can think up, right? And constraints of current technology yeah yeah that that, that is a little little bit bounded by that i feel i'm still waiting for my flying car (laughs) where are we supposed to have those by now well wasn't it what date was it in back to the future part two when they had the flying cars we passed it wasn't it passed it 20 was it 2020 or 2010 2017 or something i'm gonna have to look that up maybe maybe 2015 uh maybe a topic for another episode what, Back to the Future Part 2? I'm all over that. Yeah, maybe uh, a, an episode dissecting the science of movies. Didn't you have a court? Didn't you have a class about that at one point? At Teal, yes, I did. I was very proud of developing that course, and we oh. had some books with it. And, you know, we talked about can the movie Armageddon ever happen or like Deep Impact? Can you ever fly <laughs> a ship up there, put a warhead down in the middle? And ultimately, the short answer is no, not no. for another few decades. Well, I mean, we, we just put stuff on Mars. So, that's and, true. You know, so that's exciting. Yeah. So, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, interestingly about Bell, however, I thought this was the most amusing thing. He considered his invention, the telephone, an intrusion on his work as a scientist and refused to have a telephone in his study. <laughs> I That's thought that was hilarious. Hilarious. Uh, Also, apparently, when he died in 1922 at the age of 75, complications of diabetes, uh, upon the conclusion of his funeral... Every phone on the continent of North America was silenced in honor of the man who had given to mankind the means for direct communication at a distance. And that's an exact quote. Isn't that cool? That is cool. So we do have an honorable mention today. It's not his birthday, but it is the anniversary of his death. And I could not let it go. Also, March 3rd, uh, 1993, this is Albert Bruce Sabin. And uh, for those of you that follow vaccine news, he is uh, responsible for the Sabin polio vaccine. A Polish American physician, microbiologist, best known for his polio vaccine. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1955 is when that was developed. And next to smallpox, that was the next big debilitating disease, right? And um uh, we're almost done with eradicating it. Uh, there are a few cases, well, not a few, a few hundred cases, uh, maybe a few thousand in a few countries, but in mo- mo- most of the world has uh, gone rid of polio. Uh, yeah, he was also known for uh, other stuff, uh, viral diseases mostly. Uh, he did some cancer work and some work on toxoplasma. Interesting. All right, that's uh, cool. enough of that, unless you guys have anything to add. Well, no, but I, I think it's important to note that, uh, you know, we, we are so close to eradicating that polio, like you said. We are, yeah. And and the WHO is using his vaccine. So there's two different vaccines. There's the SALT. That's what we use in this country. Uh-huh. I think we've talked about this before. And, then and the, SALT the has a Western Pennsylvania connection, well, specifically to your alma mater. Lab. Yeah, I worked oh, in yeah. the labs where he created the vaccine, and then they remodeled them, so... I, I, I'm I'm fascinated that they, they just, you know, refurbish those labs for like other researchers instead of like uh, making them museums, you know? You would think, right? Well, space is limited. Th- right? That is true. It is true. <laughs> yeah, so so we're using that Sobin vaccine because it's a, a little more potent and it is, it's working pretty well because this is a person to person disease. There's no uh-huh. animals or anything else involved. So if we can cut down the human cases, we should be able to get rid of this thing. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Wouldn't it? 
Uh, speaking of vaccines, let's offer mm-hmm. a quick coronavirus update on vaccines and numbers. So worldwide, we're sitting at about 116 million cases with two and a half million deaths, uh, which if you remember from about a year ago, uh, those numbers in terms of percentages were much, much higher, right? We were looking at oh, yeah. five to six uh, percent case fatality. But, you know, this is uh, this is less than two percent now. And uh, U.S. cases, uh, we're sitting at about 29 and a half million with half a million deaths, 531,000. PA is inching up closer to a million cases with 24,000 deaths. But the good news is that we are vaccinating people in the U.S. and uh, we're vaccinating them as quickly as we can get those vaccines. Uh, So far, as of yesterday, actually, 51.8 51.8 million people have received at least one dose and 26.2 million have been fully vaccinated with two doses. This is only referring to Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. And uh, just recently, within the last week or so, uh, Johnson & Johnson's vaccine got EUA approval, emergency use authorization from the FDA, which is fantastic because, hey, it adds to our effort in vaccines, but more importantly, I think, uh, personally, I think it's it's a game changer because Johnson Johnson is a one-shot vaccine. Yeah, that's it. You just need but, one dose. And the storage is different, too. Absolutely. Isn't it more so easily that's, stored? That's probably more important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I honestly think if, if they can get enough doses out there, that's going to get more people vaccinated way more quickly. Well, especially uh, those people, like you said, who are looking at this as, you know, going back for a second shot, I mean... In, Uh, I think about people I've talked to who their second dose or second shot that was going to be scheduled ended up, uh, it got canceled for shortages or being pushed back indefinitely. So I think with this single shot regimen, I think that's going to help to bump up those fully vaccinated numbers significantly. That's very exciting news. I wonder if the FDA will allow sort of mix and match. Uh, I don't don't think you could do that maybe with like going from an mRNA vaccine to Johnson and Johnson, but maybe between Moderna and Pfizer, I I don't know. I feel personally, again, I haven't seen that data. This is mere speculation on my end, right? But I, between Moderna and Pfizer, I I personally don't see a problem with that because it's against the spike protein. I haven't I haven't looked at the mRNA sequence, but, but the uh, so the efficacy rates between Moderna and Pfizer are slightly different, correct? Just by a few percentage points Sing, uh, after a single dose or double dose after double, after double doses dose. yeah they're, they're they're negligible okay at that point i just didn't know based on that efficacy rate in which you had mentioned how that impacts how f- efficient the vaccine would then be if you mixed and matched got moderna first pfizer second sure and i sure, thought yeah. i saw yeah. saw keller maybe had a thought about that you don't think that would be Wise, you know the all the data that we yeah. have are from you know two Moderna doses or two Pfizer doses. I, I, I agree. Show it to me. I hear what you're saying. I under, I completely get it. They're similar vaccines against the same protein, so you would think that you could mix and match. I would just. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. Hopefully, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one. I was just wondering whether the FDA or any scientists have looked at that, right? I, it, and at this point, <laughs> there might be a few people who I don't know maybe lie about which dose they, which vaccine mm-hmm. they got for the first one and ended up getting a different one. I don't know. Yeah, that could be. But I don't think really, the government has time to look into anything right now. They need to <laughs> get the vaccine out. Yeah. <laughs> but they're quite busy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So in terms of the vaccine effort in the U.S., um, like I said, uh, we're almost at, uh, what, uh, uh, 26.2 haven't been fully vaccinated. Some states are doing a little bit better than others. Uh, Alaska and New Mexico have approximately 23% of their population with at least one shot, while Utah is uh, last on that list of 50 states with 13% having one shot. However, uh, I then dug a little bit further into that. In Utah's defense, uh, they're pretty much using all the vaccine shots they're given. So uh, they, I guess they, their vaccine supply is just lower than other states. But then again, their population you know, might not be as high as others. So uh, they actually have used up 82% of their vaccine supply. 
uh, in Utah, even though their overall numbers are a bit lower. But they're they're putting those shots in in those arms. Most states are our national average for uh, shots in arms is seventy seven percent. So we only have about twenty three percent of the vaccine supply sitting in freezers, I guess, or not delivered yet to supply centers, et cetera. Maybe it's en route or whatever, but eh. still a quarter. That's it's still a lot. I agree with you, but they're working on yeah. it. Yes, they are. They're working on it. And you know, uh, we're moving along. Uh, we, we've all had at least one shot so far as we're half backed. Yes. Educators at a medical school, uh, which is why I guess we are on, on the list. In PA, we're in Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, currently, the vaccination phase allows for uh, educators and frontline sort of workers to be vaccinated. So that's how we ended up with vaccine shots. Uh, my second so- shot is actually this week, Friday. Ours is uh, next, week. Is it next week, I think. Mm-hmm. Ours is for the us. Oh, you, you yeah, have Pfizer. Next Friday. We do. We, uh, okay, we, yeah. I thought... Because I thought we were going to get Moderna, and we, yeah, uh, yeah uh, Keller caught that when we were waiting afterwards. Yeah, okay. Pfizer's uh, in between doses is three weeks. Moderna is four weeks. But yeah. anyway, all right. So uh, oh, let's not right. drag it too much. Any other updates on uh, coronavirus, Keller? You had uh, found some interesting stuff there. Yeah, I was reading the newspaper the other day. And- You know, the the more cases we have and the more data we have, the more interesting things uh, that we may find out, and and these may be real, they may not be, but one, um, one, what they were calling a side effect, but it's not one uh, clinical manifestation that that caught the attention of a lot of uh, clinicians is uh, some women who have gone for a mammogram shortly after having had the vaccine were getting false positive results. And so the mammogram was coming back positive, but it was because they had swollen lymph nodes. And so the uh, the media is reporting this as a, as a side effect. It's not a side effect. It's exactly what we want to happen. Those lymph nodes, that's where all the magic's occurring. That's where the, the different immune cells are talking to each other and, and, and hopefully making those antibodies. So while and I mean, a, I can imagine, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say, I can just imagine it's, you know, as you're um, showering or doing whatever, and you feel something that feels like a lump or maybe a few lumps, that can be incredibly alarming. And I agree with you about the fact that I think the media portrayal of calling it a side effect, uh, I don't know if that's clickbait. I don't know if that's, oh, Oh, come and see, we have a new coronavirus story. Yeah, I mean, but it, it can, you can defuse the alarming nature of this manifestation by simply saying, hey, you should still go get checked out. I yeah. mean, you need to be safe. Well, just, but, uh, you know, just tell your doctor you've had yep. you've had the vaccine. We know now. Yeah. Right? And, and yeah. any vaccine could do it. It's not just the COVID vaccine. I mean, that's the point of the vaccine. So I found that interesting and I think very timely. And then as I was uh, just doing a little research uh, on that, I, uh, I came across something called COVID toe. Yeah, they've been seeing that in a, in a lot of patients. I, yeah, and I just I throw that up here too. Um, so they've been seeing this just like with the the false positive mammograms. Uh, it's it's painful. Uh, basically, it happens in the cold. It's uh, something called uh, chill blains. I'd never heard of it. Uh, I guess they're they're just painful red or purple lesions that you get on your fingers or toes in the winter if you're out in the cold too long. Sure. And um, it's it's usually caused by inflammation due to cold temperatures. Well, we're seeing an increase in this in patients that have been vaccinated. Oh, oh. So, that's interesting. Or excuse me, not vaccinated, have had COVID. That have had COVID, okay. That have had yeah, COVID. Have had yeah. COVID. And yeah. so, um, so some dermatologists are saying if this presents, if you have these symptoms, that should warrant a test. Right. For right. COVID, uh, yeah. a lab yeah. test. That so, was interesting, so. Uh, and, that is and, very interesting. If I remember correctly, they're saying that in some people it's appearing before other COVID symptoms, right? Or, so it could or be in, in lieu of other symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so just okay. like the 
the loss of, of taste and smell. That's sure. kind of abnormal, you know? Right. Right. Do you know how many, um, what, what the rate of like COVID toe is among, you know, confirmed cases of COVID, anything like no, that? I didn't see that at all. That would be interesting to research over the next few episodes and see if there is we'll a stat see. that comes out from that. Maybe, maybe we'll have weird COVID symptoms or you know, abnormal <laughs> COVID symptoms episode. Well, that brings, us, uh, that brings us to our topic today, which is weird medical phenomena. I don't know how we were... We, I don't know how we ended up on this, but we were talking about something related to a medical lecture the other day, and this came up. Well, I think we started, we just started discussing, you know, okay, med school students and, you know, students in general get taught about the common disorders or conditions. Uh, I don't know, myocardial infarction, cancers, bacterial infections, everything in your guys' realm. And it, it got us all thinking. What are some of the weird things that are that truly bizarre yeah. that don't get that are extremely rare, but that don't really get a lot? And you know, you the know one which, thing that uh, I thought of, or you ahead. know, which uh, chapters in parasitology that we don't really cover? Hmm. Parasites of minor medical importance. <laughs> that, <laughs> that chapter usually gets ignored. I mean, how many cases do you have to have to be important enough? I guess is really the question, yeah. right? Sinus and verses comes to mind. You know, or, or 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 who do you have to infect, right? Like if if you're a if you're Good a medical if you're a medical student in the United States and you plan on practicing in the United States, maybe we're not going to tell you too much about dracunculus you know like you're not going to see that, you know. So it it depends, I guess. Yeah, but it's so cool. I have it in my lecture next week. It is cool. You will oh, learn. Oh, that's good. You are lecturing next week. I was going to ask you that. Oh, yeah. Everybody's calendar. been wondering. Out of my calendar. So, okay, this is good news. I'll take it out. No, yeah, absolutely. I'm doing those two. I, you know, I love my parasites, man. I'll, I'll fight you for them if I have to. Oh, okay. okay. I'd like to pay to see that. Um, <laughs> we will live stream it. Wait, we can do that now maybe get some money thrown at this have a pay-per-view uh welter weight right. fight fund the um, podcast so I, right. I was so we were thinking about like they have those weird shows on uh tlc right uh the tlc channel about you know people with weird habits maybe even weird eating habits and i think a few of those episodes have been about weird cases involving people eating inedible food or mm-hmm. food Food stuff that has no Connor, nutritional uh, your, value your, your, your whatsoever, inter- right? Your internet keeps breaking up a bit. So if you've got stuff on Wi-Fi, yeah, maybe, I don't off, know. Yeah. yeah, cut it off. Yeah, apologies. Uh, I'm My phone's off the internet. Am I coming through a little bit better now or am I breaking up? No, you're fine no, now. Hear, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, just keep me informed in case I do cut out at all. But you guys have what we're going to talk about too. Um, so this condition called uh, uh, pica. Mm-hmm. So pica is this urge to eat what's called non-food. So anything that doesn't have nutritive non-food. value, <laughs> non-food. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be things like hair, things like dirt. Um, a common example of not what I would call pica, but when we chew gum, right? So no real nutritive value there. Um, I mean, really anything that considered something incredibly weird like i said hair dirt um i don't know maybe as i was talking about the beginning of the episode the puppy eating snow nonstop. uh it can be due to multiple different types of causes possible mineral deficiency stress um, i believe schizophrenics sometimes yeah. manifest pica yes. uh developmental conditions certain intellectual disabilities and it can also be malnourishment as well, which makes sense. If you're malnourished and really want to eat something, you resort to eating something like hair or dirt, as gross as that sounds. Um, so is, is, is this cool? Uh, so uh, worms, worm eggs, like hookworm, for sure. example, um, uh, roundworm, whipworm, these are ingested eggs. Uh, it's been hypothesized that the... Uh, once you once once kids historically would ingest the eggs, get the adult worms, the worms would eat their blood, they become anemic, and the chronic anemia would cause them to display pica behavior. 
so that they would eat more dirt to eat more eggs. <laughs> and so the cycle continued so that that predisposed those children to ingest more dirt where the eggs were. Now, whether or not that's and true, that's, that's something I read uh, in, in one of Tessowitz's books. No, I, I, you know, you, you got me hooked on that author. I think he's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. The other thing is that you, you said, too, uh, besides the anemia, it's the... Uh, uh, psychological issues is another reason for pica behavior. Yep. So, is it um, is it considered a psychological disorder? Is it an, yeah. in in the book? Yeah. I don't know about the book. I believe it. I, I, I would, you mean like the DSM? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I would think so. Uh, one other fact I mean, it's about coming. pica behavior. One one last thing. Um, it is now uh, a I don't want to say a common way because this is not a common disease, but it is a uh, a mechanism for transmission of infant botulism because the oh. spores are in the dirt. If the kids are continually eating dirt, once again, we're talking about outside. Sure. Um, they they pose a risk. The most common way is still uh, ingestion of, of honey in kids. For botulism in kids. For yeah. infant botulism. Yeah. Infant botulism is the most common form of botulism in the country, about 200 cases a year. Yeah. yeah. So a quick search here. Um, it is listed under DSM-5 criteria. Okay. And, yeah, and the so. actions to constitute pica, they have to persist for more than one month at an age when eating such objects is considered developmentally inappropriate. So, of course, when you're a baby and you're sticking, you know, anything in your mouth, toys, That's anything fine, like yeah. that, that is fine. But after a certain developmental milestone, and it can also be culturally linked too, right? Sure. It can't be part of a culturally sanctioned practice that would be considered non pica. Right. So there are some strict definitions here, but yeah, for at least one month at an age that is appropriate and non cultural uh, related. But I mean, with kids, uh, and, and you know, any of our listeners, they may come across the term geophagia, right? Like dirt eating, earth eating. Uh, it, it, it's common with kids that play outside, right? I mean, Mm-hmm. Well, sandcastles look good. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. What's this next one here? So I think this one, I forget if I was talking to you about this, Keller, no, or I don't think if so. I was talking to Delbert about this. You were this. talking to me about it, yeah. Okay, because that's right. A few months ago, I think you went on a James Bond binge or a James Bond marathon. I did go on a James Bond uh-huh. binge. And we and, talked about how most of these movies would not fly with uh, uh, PC culture today. Current right? societal like they, norms, yeah. It's yeah, just they, they like some some of the lines. Sexism, in those movies, blatant yeah, sexism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you listen to this, you're like, hmm. I know. How you got away with that? <laughs> it def- some of those definitely haven't aged well. The other thing that's really bizarre, as anybody knows about James Bond, is every villain has to have something kind of wrong with them whether it is psychological or you know like a scar or a tick or you know something that makes them unique and i think it was the one pierce brosnan movie where there were there was something wrong with the guy's nociceptors his pain receptors that caused him to either not feel pain or when he would get hurt it would instead cause him pleasure (laughs) So again, just something, right. something really kind of like weird there. So then it got me thinking, you know, what is, what is a condition where you just are extremely insensitive to pain? And as it would happen, congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis, otherwise known as uh, CIPA, C-I-P-A. CIPA. And, and this is when individuals can, or hydrosis is no sweating, right? Anhydrosis is a lack, either decreased or completely absent uh, sweating response. And that is because uh, with these individuals, with the, this congenital disorder, you get a mutation in a gene known as NTRK1. And with this mutation, this NTRK1 gene codes for a receptor that's going to be found on the surfaces of neurons. And these neurons are eventually going to divide and um, develop into the neurons that transmit pain, temperature, and touch sensations in terms of the somatosensory system. And without this receptor being fully functional, this uh, mutation causing a defective or lack of NTRK1 receptor, the neurons for those sensations cannot grow and divide, and they end up dying. 
And obviously, if you lose sensory neurons that detect and transmit stimuli related to pain, temperature, et cetera, well, you're going to have extreme insensitivity to those sensations. And so this, have- this mute, just so you can simplify it, this mutation, if present on neurons and neurons are cells that conduct sensations, right? Mm-hmm. To your brain. So you can like feel something, right? Exactly. If, if, if not present, those neurons will die and mm-hmm. then you can feel sensation effectively. So when neurons are developing, and I believe, you know, I'm recalling this from embryology and from the cell stuff that I did for the MMS program for you, Delbert, um, certain cells need signals in order to either survive or not undergo apoptosis. Uh Uh So without this receptor getting this signal saying, hey, you neuron, you've been selected, you're the lucky one that is going to grow, divide and become a fully functioning neuron. Without that receptor to latch on to that signal, well, those neurons are going to undergo apoptosis yeah. or yeah. Uh, programmable cell death. A, lo- a lot of cells exhibit same behavior like that. So like B cells, T cells, and immune responses, if they don't get that surface receptor signal, they're, they're going to die. They're not going to survive. It's the same nerves. A lot of these uh, mechanisms are conserved across. Yeah. Cells. I th- and I think it's really cool, the fact that it's so widespread. And So these- let me ask you this. Is this mm-hmm. for... All sensation, or is just simply pain, temperature, touch? Like, well, can, pain, can these people still smell things? Uh, taste they would, things. They would still smell things um, in terms of those are different types of receptors, right? So the okay. special senses types of receptors, whether they're primary neurons or sensory cells, right? Like gustation cells or olfactory cells, those are going to be preserved here. And again, with more research, we could do an entire episode on this. But those <laughs> neurons, I'm sure you guys would love that. But those same neurons, um, they have certain channels, right? These neurons are going to have uh, TRP channels. And whether it's a pain receptor or a thermal receptor, these TRP channels can respond to the same types of stimuli, which is why pain and temperature are sometimes linked, right? Because certain chemicals can cause a painful sensation in, you know, a thermal receptor, let's say. But um, yeah, it's no effects on, you know, anything like seeing, taste, smell, anything like that. And, and no effect on motor function. Those are different neurons, right? Uh, no effect on motor function. The only thing that would be an indirect... Is a sensory motor response, right? Like if you grab something exactly. hot, you're not going to let go. Uh-huh. And that's yeah. why, I mean, and I think watching that James Bond movie as a kid, I thought, oh, wow, this is the perfect villain for Bond. He can't feel pain, can't process pain the same way we can. He's almost invincible, right? Wouldn't yeah. that be cool to live a life feeling no pain? When in actuality, uh, I <laughs> once I got to a certain age, I realized, oh, wow, uh, whenever you get near a hot stove, you're not going to realize that your hand is burning and the skin is cooked quote until you unquote, smell it maybe until you smell it mm. and and then and, it's too late <laughs> yeah and you know I, I remember giving the lecture at teal and always saying you know pain as much as nobody wants to feel it pain is one of the most important you know adaptable responses that we have in the human body because of course it's going to tell us hey something's wrong time to get it fixed or checked out by your uh, local doctor so I, I just Googled this out of curiosity. So the incidence of this disorder is estimated to be one in 25,000. That's actually that's common. a little yeah, bit common. More that's common that, that. Yeah, exactly. What's well, pre odd, like one in a million. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. One in 25,000. Sheesh. And of course, because you are destroying these neurons, I mean, what, during um, embryological development at the current time, there's no available treatment, uh, right. you know, nothing that can replace the missing sensation. Once those neurons and those sensory neurons are gone, well, guess what? You can't really get yeah. that back. And the reason why you have um, anadrosis, the lack of sweating, is because you don't additionally that with that mutation, the nerves leading to the sweat glands are also non-functional or very that severely uh, damaged. Wow, yeah. This Which that's going to be bad too, right? You're not going to be able to control a fever. You're not going to be able to control adaptively, you know, sweating to cool yourself off. Your body temperature is going to be out of um, out of whack as well. Ooh, man. Yeah, from, yeah. Jesus, from eating dirt to not feeling <laughs> any pain to how about eating people? Yeah, but well, 
<laughs> there have been a few movies. There have been a few movies on those too. You know, well, that's, that's our next. That's our next. Movie, yeah. guys. Maybe, maybe we should have an episode on just science of movies. Uh, hey, I am definitely do that. I am on board with that. So what is it? I have. I, I have not heard of this Kotar delusion. Is oh, that right? Man. So. Ooh, this is this is extreme. I had to. I just had to throw it out there. So so we're moving we're, just for our listeners. We're moving on from SIPA. Yes, yes, and we're going on to what's called the Cotard delusion. This is also known as the walking corpse <laughs> syndrome, which is just. I mean, talk about something that just catches oh your eye. Gosh. Right? Talk about clickbait. Um, extremely yeah. rare. Only two hundred known cases around the world. Wow. But and I mean wow, that's com- not a lot at all. No, compared well, to everything God, else. Look at these symptoms. Jeez. So this is when and it happens. It can happen suddenly. It can be associated with depression or other types of brain malfunction. But it seems to be a sudden onset where the person with this syndrome believes that they have died, or that their flesh is rotting off, or which really freaks me out. And I probably won't go to bed for a while tonight thinking about this. They think that they're non-existent, that they no longer exist on the planet wow. Earth. And talk, talk about some existential angst. Oh, I mean, I'm afraid I'm going to look in the mirror and think, oh, uh, I, I guess I've died. We'll text you, know, you good, Father. You'll oh, listen. thank you, please. <laughs> we'll get but, you out um, of it. I mean, but, this is crazy. Oh, I mean, thinking about like Walking Dead, right? I, I just, That's what was, I'm thinking of, Yeah. You know? So and now, other, than, other, other than that, what's the what's the main symptom? So one of the main symptoms that manifests is uh, nihilism, right? Which okay. is the belief or the credo, uh, or I know there are nihilists in the world that believe that nothing in life has any type of value or meaning. I, I what's the movie where they keep saying, "Oh, the nihilists are coming after us." Big Lebowski. If you guys have seen the big, you know, I still have not movie. seen that movie. Oh. I know, I know, I know. Don't you remember? <laughs> Keller, you've seen it, right? Yes. yes. So the, the bad guys in the movie, they continually say to this poor Jeff Bridges character, Lebowski, mm. they, keep th- they keep saying, we're nihilists. We care about nothing, Lebowski. Nothing. <laughs> it's fantastic. You have to was, watch was it. Was that the movie that put Jeff Bridges on the map? I think he was well known before that, but that's when he truly, I, in my, I, the Took movie... Off. I think the movie wasn't that popular it when it wasn't. first came out. I think oh, it was now, maybe a now it's, like it's a cult. It's a cult it's a classic cult now. Yeah yeah, 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 it is. I think they're always. I, begging, I will. I will find it and watch it. I, I. I will. I will. They're always begging him and John Goodman, saying, "Hey, uh, at every convention, they probably get sick of it. Hey, when's the <laughs> sequel? When's Big Lebowski two, 2 coming out? And they can't touch it. It's a classic. You cannot make a sequel on that movie. Oh, you're, you, you'll probably ruin it. Yeah." Yeah, but um, possible causes. So um, could be a side effect of dementia, um, bleeding in the brain, uh, encephalopathy, multiple sclerosis. This could manifest, again, extremely rare, but multiple sclerosis, you might get this as a manifestation, uh, stroke or um, Parkinson's disease. So so just anything- out of curiosity, for onset of disease, are we talking for most individuals, this does not happen till, well, of those 200 known cases, to like what your 50s 60s 70s or is uh, it earlier so i would have to do a little bit more digging there i did not see an age of onset okay. um I, I would guess because it's associated with things like i don't know stroke uh um, i mean i'm looking does, at like ms when does ms and park, usually i mean is parkinson's is late midlife? unless you have i guess early parkinson's ms yeah. you can start having symptoms of ms maybe as early 30s. as 30s but yeah they do not in, it get intense till much later. I guess you could have early onset Alzheimer's or early onset dementia, right? Sure. But most of you these can. seem to be late uh, stage conditions, disease. late mm-hmm. stage. Or late, so, late age is what I meant. Yeah. Exactly. But um, another possible cause that was included in the article in our references section was um, a pos- possible damage to the brain region that is responsible for facial recognition. And that would be... Um, they didn't name it specifically, but I believe that would be the fusiform face area or the FFA that's found in the uh, visual system that's located in the inferior temporal uh, cortex of the brain. If you say so, it's <laughs> and I well <laughs> we do bugs under a microscope. So <laughs> but and what happens is that becomes damaged, and the link between 
um, that part of the visual, uh, the temporal cortex that's responsible for visual recognition, it becomes unlinked somehow or detached from the emotional regions of the brain, most likely the limbic system. So you look at yourself and suddenly, I guess, without that emotion or that hook, you feel like you're non-existent and that you have died and you, you don't have a care in the world. So, yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, very wow. interesting. That's something that I would not want to experience ever. No. Yeah. I have this. This is the first time I hear of this. Uh, electroconvulsive therapy is beneficial. Uh, have you heard, have you heard of that? Is that like pretty much like what zap in your brain or zap? In your... So electrical stimulation of different brain areas that maybe that helps sure, to, sure. you know, uh, I don't know, maybe I get the link back or not back, but at least stimulate, you know, that feeling again. I don't know. Well, wow. apparently suicide attempts are high with people with cotard dilution well, because it's a way it's a way to prove they're already dead and oh. that they can't die again. Yep. Man, you, you're gonna these. send me a, you're gonna send me on a deep rabbit hole. I was gonna here. say, gonna, don't well, don't, don't go do down now. don't go down that path. Oh it's wow! Not end well. Oh, I'm, right. there's some uh, 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 a bunch of NCBI PubMed articles on this. This it's kind of interesting. It's really cool. Uh, I think I might mention it, however briefly, because I tend to go on tangents, as you know. But I might mention no. it briefly. No. Uh, during my visual lecture sure, on sure. Uh, on Friday, that might be something uh, for the students. First, like. uh, first described by Jules Cotard in 1882. Mm. Huh. Wow, this is the neuropsychiatric. This is interesting. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> no. All right, in the uh, interest of time, what else we got here? So, uh, for our listeners, one of the things that we're gonna try to do is uh, get episodes out uh, more commonly, but we're gonna try to have them shorter. So we're going to aim for 30 to 45 minutes at most, but uh, uh, bring you a new episode every two weeks or so. So that, that should be a, a, a change. Yeah. And I, I think that'll be good. All right. Game segment. All right. I tried to get to pass us off to far this week. So we'll have to see about next week. Uh, so give us a uh, just disappeared. There it is. Give us All right. Time. So, a uh, quick recap from the last uh, episode's riddle. We had a 35-year-old male who came to the emergency department in the southern U.S. with intermittent diarrhea and vomiting of three months' duration. He said to the doctor that he felt there were zigzagging blisters in his mouth. Uh, the lesions had been occurring for the past seven months and would last for several days before resolving. The ID doctor noticed the zigzagging lesions and pulled out one actually from beneath his tongue with tweezers. And they were identified as a worm that specifically invades the mouth. And our question was, what is the worm and how is it transmitted? And of course, we have one correct answer here from Dr. Rick Lorenzo. Thank you, Rick. He says, I couldn't remember the bug that Keller talked about. Just remembered something about lip, lip. I hope that means lesions. It does say lip lessons. So <laughs> I surely wasn't talking about lip lessons. Why? Well, and hey. weird transmission. I was not. Google brought up, I believe it's gondolinema pulchrum. That is correct. It is a cattle and sheep parasite. However, it is found in cockroaches. So that is the uh, what that is the how it's transmitted part, right? So so it's actually transmitted to humans when we ingest cockroach parts. Ugh. So lovely. What I had found was a case, uh, uh, and and I put the link in. It should be in our episode uh, to a case study that's published in the literature of a young Georgia man who was living in the middle of nowhere and had stored grain, just loose grain in the back of his uh, RV or camper and was eating that grain. Okay. And in that grain were cockroaches. Yeah. And so he was eating the, the, uh, the cockroach parts. The, there's only been 
uh, less than 100 people ever registered with these parasites. And it's always in the mouth, it looks like. The worms, unless I'm mistaken, the worms inside the cockroaches can get pretty long. Is that right? Yes. This is gross. I know. They are a nematode. So they are, are a type of roundworm. They don't get very large, though, in, in the human host, I guess. I, don't, yeah, I mean, compare yeah. our mouth to a cockroach. Right? Sure, 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 sure. No reason to eat. I do believe they're a filarial worm. Uh, they look like it. I'm looking well, they're, at they're They're their own little, their own little family. Gondolo Nima today. Yeah, this they're is the so only cool. species in there. So they are usually it is, uh, it looks like, uh, they are parents of birds and mammals and transmitted by insects. So there you are. So well, that's they right, do right. really zigzag in the uh yeah, don't they found some pictures? Yeah. So the it was uh the the dude in this case had to be treated a few times with anti-helminthic, so anti-worm drugs, and eventually they, they resolved and I guess they said stop eating that grain in your car or whatever. <laughs> Felt a little bit better, but it's just very obscure, like we've been talking about parasites. Yeah, we like uh, we like obscure parasites. So, what's uh, what's the new riddle for today? Well, we're actually going to to stay in the uh, world of parasitology today because I knew it'll make you happy, you know. So we're gonna stay there. Okay, so this episode's question: We have a fifty-four-year-old male who presented to the emergency department with confusion and behavioral changes. He had received a kidney transplant two months prior with no complications. The donated organ was traced back to a 43-year-old female who had died of a stroke. Her liver was donated to a different to a woman who was being evaluated for onset of tremors and difficulty walking. And her second kidney and heart were donated to a different patient who had since developed encephalitis, which is brain inflammation. Over a period of two months, our patient, the kidney transplant patient's health deteriorated and he died. Single-celled protozoa were found in tissues, and the surviving transplant patients also tested positive for the same protozoa. So my question is, what is this parasite called, and what is the drug used to treat it? Yeah, that's an interesting one. It's yeah. very interesting. You see, you see me smiling because uh, I, I, I think I know the answer. Okay, we will we will see. We will see. Yeah, maybe yeah. you should uh, maybe you should submit it and give Rick a run for it. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's a uh, if it is what I'm thinking about, it's it's an interesting one. Yeah, cool. You'll have to tell me as soon as we're done here. All right. So unless uh, unless you guys have anything to add, that would be a wrap up for our episode. No, but I'm, I'm hoping we're getting episodes out of a faster pace. We'll do our best for our listeners slash viewers. Absolutely. So you can email us at thebiobusters at gmail.com. You can find us on iTunes. You can just Google the Biobusters uh, podcast will come up. Uh, any podcast catcher, you can download uh, to your phone, to your device, computer, etc. Listen in the car, listen at home, whatever you like. And uh, if you like what you hear and see, like and subscribe. That'll be great. I'm Delbert Ebi Abdallah. And we have Dr. Fawner and Dr. Keller. Cool. And we will uh, see you next time. Two weeks. Bye. Two weeks. Okay. Hopefully. Well, thank you for watching. <laughs> Absolutely. Bye.